Hi friends, I am Annie F. Downs. Let's read the Gospels. The Gospels are the first four books of the New Testament in the Bible, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. These are the stories of Jesus Christ's life on earth, the friendships, the parables, the sacrifices, the meals, the miracles. These are our last few days in the Gospels together. And then on Wednesday, May 1st, we're going to start the book of Acts. After a year and a half of reading Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we're jumping into the book of Acts, and we're going to go through it together for the month of May. We're going to read one chapter a day. You are going to love it, y'all. I cannot wait. So we are finishing out our time together by reading the book of Acts. It's going to be awesome. We've got a free reading plan for you for that month. You can just go to AnnieFDowns.com slash gospels and download that totally for free. We just want you to be ready as we jump into a book we have never read before. If you are loving being in the gospels with us, will you help spread the word about the show by rating and reviewing it on Apple Podcasts? Those ratings really help other people find out about Let's Read the Gospels, so they are a huge help. Here's how this works. As you know, we are going to read all four books in 30 days. So we are going to read three chapters a day. That is what we've been doing. So we, you can listen on the podcast. You can watch on YouTube, read along in your own Bible. And then I'll pray. And that's it. Today is day 28. And I'll be reading Matthew chapters 21 through 23 from the New Living Translation. And if you got your Let's Read the Gospels Guided Journal, we are on page 181. Matthew 21. As Jesus and the disciples approached Jerusalem, they came to the town of Bethphage on the Mount of Olives. Jesus sent two of them on ahead. Go into the village over there, he said. As soon as you enter it, you will see a donkey tied there with its colt beside it. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone asks, what are you doing? Just say, the Lord needs them and he will immediately let you take them. This took place to fulfill the prophecy that said, Tell the people of Jerusalem, look, your king is coming to you. He is humble, riding on a donkey, riding on a donkey's colt. The two disciples did as Jesus commanded. They brought the donkey and the colt to him and threw their garments over the colt, and he sat on it. Most of the crowd spread their garments on the road ahead of him, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Jesus was in the center of the procession, and the people all around him were shouting, Praise God for the Son of David. Blessings on the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Praise God in highest heaven. The entire city of Jerusalem was in an uproar as he entered. Who is this? they asked. And the crowds replied, It's Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth and Galilee. Jesus entered the temple and began to drive out all the people buying and selling animals for sacrifice. He knocked over the tables of the money changers and the chairs of those selling doves. He said to them, The scriptures declare my temple will be called a house of prayer, but you have turned it into a den of thieves. The blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them. The leading priests and the teachers of religious law saw these wonderful miracles and heard even the children in the temple shouting, Praise God for the Son of David. But the leaders were indignant. They asked Jesus, Do you hear what these children are saying? Yes, Jesus replied. Haven't you ever read the scriptures? For they say, you have taught children and infants to give you praise. Then he returned to Bethany where he stayed overnight. In the morning, as Jesus was returning to Jerusalem, he was hungry and he noticed a fig tree beside the road. He went over to see if there were any figs, but there were only leaves. Then he said to it, may you never bear fruit again. And immediately the fig tree withered up. The disciples were amazed when they saw this and asked, how did the fig tree wither so quickly? Then Jesus told them, I tell you the truth, if you have faith and don't doubt, you can do things like this and much more. You can even say to this mountain, may you be lifted up and thrown into the sea and it will happen. You can pray for anything and if you have faith, you will receive it. When Jesus returned to the temple and began teaching, the leading priests and elders came up to him. They demanded, by what authority are you doing all these things? Who gave you the right? I'll tell you by what authority I do these things. If you answer one question, Jesus replied, did John's authority to baptize come from heaven or was it merely human? They talked it over among themselves. If we say it was from heaven, he will ask us why we didn't believe John. But if we say it was merely human, we'll be mobbed because the people believe John was a prophet. So they finally replied, we don't know. And Jesus responded, then I won't tell you by what authority I do these things. 
But what do you think about this? A man with two sons told the older boy, son, go out and work in the vineyard today. The son answered, no, I won't go. But later he changed his mind and went anyway. Then the father told the other son, you go. And he said, yes, sir, I will. But he didn't go. Which of the two obeyed his father? They replied, the first. Then Jesus explained his meaning. I tell you the truth, corrupt tax collectors and prostitutes will get into the kingdom of God before you do. For John the Baptist came and showed you the right way to live, but you didn't believe him, while tax collectors and prostitutes did. And even when you saw this happening, you refused to believe him and repent of your sins. Now listen to another story. A certain landowner planted a vineyard, built a wall around it, dug a pit for pressing out the grape juice, and built a lookout tower. Then he leased the vineyard to tenant farmers and moved to another country. At the time of the grape harvest, he sent his servants to collect his share of the crop. But the farmers grabbed his servants, beat one, killed one, and stoned another. So the landowner sent a larger group of his servants to collect for him, but the results were the same. Finally, the owner sent his son, thinking, surely they will respect my son. But when the tenant farmers saw his son coming, they said to one another, here comes the heir to this estate. Come on, let's kill him and get the estate for ourselves. So they grabbed him, dragged him out of the vineyard and murdered him. When the owner of the vineyard returned, Jesus asked, what do you think he will do to those farmers? The religious leaders replied, he will put the wicked men to a horrible death and lease the vineyards to others who will give him his share of the crop after each harvest. Then Jesus asked them, Didn't you ever read this in the scriptures? The stone that the builders rejected has now become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing, and it is wonderful to see. I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a nation that will produce the proper fruit. Anyone who stumbles over that stone will be broken to pieces, and it will crush anyone it falls on. When the leading priests and Pharisees heard this parable, they realized he was telling the story against them. They were the wicked farmers. They wanted to arrest him, but they were afraid of the crowds who considered Jesus to be a prophet. Matthew 22. Jesus also told them other parables. He said, The kingdom of heaven can be illustrated by the story of a king who prepared a great wedding feast for his son. When the banquet was ready, he sent his servants to notify those who were invited, but they all refused to come. So he sent other servants to tell them, The feast has been prepared, the bulls and fattened cattle have been killed, and everything is ready. Come to the banquet. But the guests he had invited ignored them and went their own way, one to his farm, another to his business. Others seized his messengers and insulted them and killed them. The king was furious, and he sent out his army to destroy the murderers and burn their town. And he said to his servants, the wedding feast is ready, and the guests I invited aren't worthy of the honor. Now go out to the street corners and invite everyone you see. So the servants brought in everyone they could find, good and bad alike, and the banquet hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to meet the guests, he noticed a man who wasn't wearing the proper clothes for a wedding. Friend, he asked, how is it that you are here without wedding clothes? But the man had no reply. Then the king said to his aides, bind his hands and feet and throw him out into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth for many are called, but few are chosen. Then the Pharisees met together to plot how to trap Jesus into saying something for which he could be arrested. They sent some of their disciples along with the supporters of Herod to meet with him. Teacher, they said, we know how honest you are. You teach the way of God truthfully. You are impartial and don't play favorites. Now tell us what you think about this. Is it right to pay taxes to Caesar or not? But Jesus knew their evil motives. You hypocrites, he said. Why are you trying to trap me? Here, show me the coin used for the tax. When they handed him a Roman coin, he asked, Whose picture and title are stamped on it? Caesar's, they replied. Well then, he said, Give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar and give to God what belongs to God. His reply amazed them, and they went away. The same day, Jesus was approached by some Sadducees, religious leaders who say there is no resurrection from the dead. They posed this question, Teacher, Moses said if a man dies without children, his brother should marry the widow and have a child who will carry on the brother's name. Well, suppose there were seven brothers. The oldest one married and then died without children, so his brother married the widow. But the second brother also died, and the third brother married her. 
This continued with all seven of them. Last of all, the woman also died. So tell us, whose wife will she be in the resurrection? For all seven were married to her. Jesus replied, Your mistake is that you don't know the scriptures and you don't know the power of God. For when the dead rise, they will neither marry nor be given in marriage. In this respect, they will be like the angels in heaven. But now as to whether there will be a resurrection of the dead, haven't you ever read about this in the scriptures? Long after Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob had died, God said, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. So he is the God of the living, not the dead. When the crowds heard him, they were astounded at his teaching. But when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees with his reply, they met together to question him again. One of them, an expert in religious law, tried to trap him with this question. Teacher, which is the most important commandment in the law of Moses? Jesus replied, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. A second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. The entire law and all the demands of the prophets are based on these two commandments. Then, surrounded by the Pharisees, Jesus asked them a question. What do you think about the Messiah? Whose son is he? They replied, he is the son of David. Jesus responded, then why does David, speaking under the inspiration of the Spirit, call the Messiah my Lord? For David said, the Lord said to my Lord, sit in the place of honor at my right hand until I humble your enemies beneath your feet. Since David called the Messiah my Lord, how can the Messiah be his son? No one could answer him. And after that, no one dared to ask him any more questions. Matthew 23. Then Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, The teachers of religious law and the Pharisees are the official interpreters of the law of Moses. So practice and obey whatever they tell you, but don't follow their example. For they don't practice what they teach. They crush people with unbearable religious demands and never lift a finger to ease the burden. Everything they do is for show. On their arms, they wear extra wide prayer boxes with scripture verses inside, and they wear robes with extra long tassels. And they love to sit at the head table at banquets and in the seats of honor in the synagogues. They love to receive respectful greetings as they walk in the marketplaces and to be called rabbi. Don't let anyone call you rabbi, for you have only one teacher, and all of you are equal as brothers and sisters. And don't address anyone here on earth as father, for only God in heaven is your father. And don't let anyone call you teacher, for you have only one teacher, the Messiah. The greatest among you must be a servant. But those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. What sorrow awaits you, teachers of religious law and you Pharisees, hypocrites, for you shut the door of the kingdom of heaven in people's faces. You won't go in yourselves, and you don't let others enter either. What sorrow awaits you, teachers of religious law and you Pharisees, hypocrites, for you cross land and sea to make one convert, and then you turn that person into twice the child of hell you yourselves are. Blind guides, what sorrow awaits you? For you say that it means nothing to swear by God's temple, but that it is binding to swear by the gold in the temple. Blind fools, which is more important, the gold or the temple that makes the gold sacred? And you say that to swear by the altar is not binding, but to swear by the gifts on the altar is binding. How blind. For which is more important, the gift on the altar or the altar that makes the gift sacred? When you swear by the altar, you are swearing by it and by everything on it. And when you swear by the temple, you are swearing by it and by God who lives in it. And when you swear by heaven, you are swearing by the throne of God and by God who sits on the throne. What sorrow awaits you, teachers of religious law and you Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are careful to tithe even the tiniest income from your herb gardens, but you ignore the more important aspects of the law, justice, mercy, and faith. You should tithe, yes, but do not neglect the more important things. Blind guides, you strain your water so you won't accidentally swallow a gnat, but you swallow a camel. What sorrow awaits you, teachers of religious law and you Pharisees, hypocrites. For you are so careful to clean the outside of the cup and the dish, but inside you are filthy, full of greed and self-indulgence. You blind Pharisee, first wash the inside of the cup and the dish, and then the outside will become clean too. What sorrow awaits you, teachers of religious law, and you Pharisees, hypocrites. For you are like whitewashed tombs, beautiful on the outside, but filled on the inside with dead people's bones and all sorts of impurity. 
Outwardly, you look like righteous people, but inwardly, your hearts are filled with hypocrisy and lawlessness. What sorrow awaits you, teachers of religious law and you Pharisees, hypocrites, for you build tombs for the prophets your ancestors killed, and you decorate the monuments of the godly people your ancestors destroyed. Then you say, if we had lived in the days of our ancestors, we would never have joined them in killing the prophets. But in saying that, you testify against yourselves that you are indeed the descendants of those who murdered the prophets. Go ahead and finish what your ancestors started, snakes, sons of vipers. How will you escape the judgment of hell? Therefore, I am sending you prophets and wise men and teachers of religious law. But you will kill some by crucifixion, and you will flog others with whips in your synagogues, chasing them from city to city. As a result, you will be held responsible for the murder of all godly people of all time, from the murder of the righteous Abel to the murder of Zechariah, son of Berechiah, whom you killed in the temple between the sanctuary and the altar. I tell you the truth, this judgment will fall on this very generation. O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones God's messengers, how often I have wanted to gather your children together as a hen protects her chicks beneath her wings, but you wouldn't let me. And now, look, your house is abandoned and desolate. For I tell you this, you will never see me again until you say, Blessings on the one who comes in the name of the Lord. That is Matthew 21 through 23 in the NLT. Let's pray together. Jesus, I just thank you for these scriptures. I thank you for the reminder that um, we get to be people of integrity where our outsides and our insides match. So help us to align that. That's what you accuse the Pharisees of is on the outside, you're really clean and neat and put together, but on the insides, you're not godly at all. And so, Lord, we want to be people of integrity. We want both to be true. We want our insides and our outsides to match. So help us with that today. Help us to even make one shift today that puts us in more alignment than we already are. We love you, Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.